So again, I'm Angelo Amber Henderson, Associate Director of Admissions at the University of Houston Law Center. Thanks for joining us in our Ask the Expert Wednesday webinar series. Uh, we're joined today by Professor Daniel Morales, Professor Lauren Simpson, Professor Meredith Duncan, and Professor Gina Warren. Uh, I am going to start with Professor Simpson. If you don't mind introducing yourself, share a little bit about your uh, background with the University of Houston Law Center and offer some words of wisdom for these admitted students. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this terrific panel. I'm so excited to be here with my other colleagues who are amazing. So uh, my name is Professor Lauren Simpson. I've, I returned to the Law Center to teach in 2010. So this is my 11th year. And all but one year I have taught in the part-time program, so at night, um, and I've taught only in the first year. So I teach Lawyering Skills and Strategies, or LSS, which is a required course in both the fall and spring semester. So we are your LSS professor full or part-time. We're the only faculty member you'll have the whole year. Um, I graduated from University of Houston Law Center, so go Cougs, back in the Jurassic, mm -hmm. and um, went and practiced um, in a maritime insurance defense litigation firm for a few years before I transitioned to one of our state courts of appeals here locally and did that for over 13 years before I transitioned here. So all I did there all day long was research and write and help uh, shepherd the interns who were there and the law clerks who were there. So, um, so uh, words of wisdom. So I'm going to really play off most of that for your questions, the questions that I get. But I would say, I think the most important thing that I wish I'd heard is that you need to schedule time for yourself. So law school is a different animal from anything you've ever done. And it's a different kind of studying and it will dominate your time. And if you don't carve out time on your schedule for yourself, whatever that translates for you, whether it's sport or religious things or gardening or walking, then you will not do it. So budget time for yourself. Awesome, thank you, Professor Simpson. Now let's go to you, Professor Morales. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, I am relatively new to the Law Center. Um, I joined the faculty, I guess this is my third year. Um, and before that, I was a professor at DePaul University in Chicago. Um, so I teach uh, constitutional law, um, which is a required one off course. Um, I also teach immigration law, which is my research uh, specialty area. And uh, additionally, I teach, I usually teach a seminar um, that ranges uh, from topic to topic. Uh, most recent topics have been uh, a seminar called Imagining Multiracial Democracy, which sort of focuses on some of the urgent issues facing our democracy today. Um, I, my background, um, I um, graduated from Yale Law School now 15 years ago, so I'm getting up there. Um, I, uh, I grew up in the DC area um, and uh, have prior to uh, Houston, I had lived in Chicago for almost 15 years. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be here. I love the Law Center um, and uh, happy to answer all your questions. In terms of advice, I mean, I think I would echo what Professor Simpson said, um, you know, maybe I'll say this, maybe this will be a little provocative, which is nobody knows what they're doing in 1L. Lots of people pretend that they know what they're doing, but nobody actually knows what they're doing. And so when people tell you to do things or you feel intimidated or concerned that you don't know what you're doing, just remember that everyone else who, think, who you think knows what they're doing is pretending. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's a little bit of a provocation, but I think it's true. Awesome. Thank you, Professor. Uh, next, we'll have Professor Meredith Duncan. Hello. Yes, thank you for um, having me join you today. I'm happy to be here and to see everybody. I would love to see more faces, actually. So if you're so inclined, turn on your video so we can put a face to a name. Um, we'd love to see you guys and see your smiling faces. There you go. That actually worked. I'm so impressed. <laughs> um, my name is Meredith Duncan. I am on the faculty here at the Law Center. I teach uh, tort law, uh, which is a, a first year, first semester required course. I also teach um, periodically criminal law. Um, that's a first year, second semester required course. And I teach professional responsibility, which is the only required course you have after the first year. Uh, and I teach uh, courses related to those seminars and the like, but 
primarily those are my focus. That's my menu of courses that I handle. Um, I have been at the law, I'm the old person of the bunch here. I've been at the law center for about 24 years. Um, uh, prior to joining the faculty at the law center, I practiced law at Vincent and Elkins, which is a large civil defense firm here in town. I graduated from the University of Houston Law Center. So like Professor Simpson, I'm an alum of the Law Center as well. Um, we were here about the same time, Lauren, except I think I was like maybe a year before you or something. I'm not going to mention how many decades ago that was, but it, it's been a minute. And um, let's see. So I'm not from anywhere in particular because my dad was in the service. So we moved every couple of years when I was uh, growing up, I earned my undergraduate degree at Northwestern University in Chicago um, and uh, a city that I love. And I've been here in Houston for quite a while. Um, words of wisdom. I like the words of wisdom that Professor Simpson and Professor Morales have provided to you. I agree with all of that. I think um, my words of wisdom are this, that when you come to law school, you should remember that this is not undergrad. Um, it's an entirely different experience and we have different expectations for you. One thing that I did that I recommend heartily to incoming law students is to treat law school like a job, like a full-time job. Um, you don't have an unlimited amount of time, so it's really not kind of the feel that you get an undergrad where you have like no responsibilities and you're like, I, I can stay up all night and do X, Y, or Z. Um, I think it's best to approach it like a job where you schedule yourself from eight to five or eight to six, um, and you're very efficient during the day and, and dedicate your time to focusing on law school. And that will give you the time, the downtime that Professor Simpson was talking about. Um, so uh, yeah, treat law school, schedule yourself, put yourself on a schedule just like it's a full-time job and more. Um, so those are my comments. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, before we get to uh, Professor Warren, last, certainly but not least, I'm going to ask uh, those of you who do not have your full name listed, please list it there. Uh, we are taking attendance, so if you don't mind just editing your name and sharing your last name. Thank you. And now Professor Warren. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to be on a panel with um, great professors here, and, and you'll definitely see that um, as you hopefully um, attend, uh, that you will see that these are some of the top professors um, that you will have. And, and so just thrilled to be on, on a panel with them. I am Gina Warren, Professor Gina Warren. I have been at the Law Center since 2016. Um, I came in as tenured associate, and then I was promoted to full a few years ago. Um, and so uh, I love the University of Houston. Before that, I was at Texas A&M law, so law School, um, and I taught there for about five years before coming here. I think it was around five, five years or so. Um, and so I teach uh, property law, first year property law, and then I also teach um, upper level energy courses. So I teach um, energy law, renewable energy law, sometimes international energy law, energy in the environment, um, basically any kind of energy related class. I was trying to get on the books a um, uh, energy and environmental justice class that I was trying to get going, but I hadn't gotten it yet. So I'm hopeful soon. But um, so I do all kinds of um, seminars or simulation courses, which you'll learn about. Um, and then also um, first year property. I'm a co-director of the Ener Institute, which is your the Environmental Energy and Natural Resources Center that we have here at the at the Law Center. Um, and so it's just really fun to be in energy. Um, before I started teaching, I practiced for about seven years at a um, at a large firm in Seattle, doing energy related work during um, uh, you basically utility and regulatory side of energy. And so that's my background for that. Before that, I went to Rutgers Law School in Camden, in New Jersey. And then I went to undergrad at the University of Arizona. So I've kind of been all over. Um, and But I love teaching. It's actually 
why I'm here. Um, so I, I teach because I really, really love it. And I love the students. I like getting to know my students. They'll say to me, you know, when I first have them in class and I actually ask them like, how was your weekend? And they'll be like, seriously, you really want to know how my weekend was? And they don't believe me. And I say, no, I really actually want to know, like, are you okay? What was it? How was your weekend? What do you have plans? Like, and I try really hard to get to know my students because um, it's just, you guys are the only reason that I do this. Um, and so I, I think that for like any kind of, I don't know, advice is not necessarily my thing, um, but I can tell you, so I am um, uh, a first generation everything. So I'm first generation high school grad, college grad, law school grad, um, and law professor. So I am like, so I get that concept. And so I think that I would just recommend that if you are in that space um, and, and you're first generation, whatever it is, even just first generation law school, that you find peers and you find mentors that can help you um, because it's really important. I, I, I spent a lot of years going it alone because I wanted to be tough and figure it out and I didn't need anybody's help. And, you know, I can do this. Um, and really that's not the way I would recommend to go about things and find people who care, find really good mentors who can help you and, um, and people who want to see you succeed. And, and that would be the best advice that I have. Thank you, Professor Warren. That's actually excellent advice. Um, and I would say um, to that end, um, you'll be surprised where your mentors might lie, right? So we have folks in student services. Uh, we have folks in the admissions office. We've all gone to law school. One of my colleagues is actually an alum of University of Houston Law Center. She won't show her face today, but that's okay. You may have had an opportunity to speak with her, Marisha Keys. So you never know where your help may come from. And, and again, don't be afraid to just put yourself out there because we all want to see you succeed. You got admitted to the law school. So that means we believe you can do it. Uh, and to Professor Morales' point, uh, fake it till you make it. All righty. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is open up the floor right now to see if there are any questions. Again, you can use your virtual hand, your real hand, and I will make some effort to make sure I'm watching everything. Um, I did see Natalie real quickly at the corner of my eye, so we're gonna go with her first. Uh, Natalie, you wanna call, come off mute and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm sorry to raise my hand first. I have to jump off a little bit early for a work call. Sure. Um, thank you everyone for sharing some of your pieces of advice and introducing yourselves. Um, I have two questions, but I'll leave the second one in case, you know, others um, ask the same one. Um, one thing, I'm coming from Rutgers University, actually, uh, from a research institute, and I've had the chance to get involved with some of the research there. Um, I've talked to a couple of my friends who have gone through law school at a couple of different locations. Some say, you know, take the chance early, email professors, see what type of RA work, volunteer work you can do even your first year to get your foot in the door. Others say, don't even try, use your first year to really, you know, get good grades, make sure that you have a good foundation and then move on to seeing what you can do with an RA position, seeing what you can do with something else. Um, I'd like to ask the group, what is your, you know, for University of Houston Law Center, What's your advice in terms of how early to get involved in research and also how to ask professors, you know, if they have any opportunities to get involved within their research based on their publications? I can start if that's okay. Sure. Um, hey, Natalie. I mean, I think this is a good opportunity. I mean, so there's always, I mean, one thing about advice, right, is that it, you, I always tell people when they think about advice, you have to think about a few things when you hear someone give advice. One is who's giving you the advice and what's their background? Because everybody's advice is gonna be filtered through their life lens. The other piece that people need to know about advice is that it's built for averages. So, you know, when you give advice to a general audience, it's not necessarily gonna to apply to you in the same way, depending on your own background, interests and needs. So to get to your situation, Natalie, it sounds like you might be an exception to the rule. Um, now, I, I probably agree in general. I mean, there's two things, right? One is, I don't know, most students wouldn't be particularly useful to faculty in the first year, right? At least my view, 
right? And so from the faculty's perspective, you know, most students coming straight out from undergrad without any major research background, I don't know how much, you know, that would pay off, right? In terms of, because it's a reciprocal relationship. However, in your specific situation where you have a research background, it's clearly an interest you have because you're asking a question about it publicly. Um, you know, I would certainly suggest that you at least start building relationships with faculty whose research interests you. I mean, it might be, you know, offering to copy edit or something. What you don't want to do, I think, as an RA is overpromise, and certainly in the first year where you are going to be really busy, everything's going to be overwhelming and new. I think it's probably better um, to, you know, err on the side of less, not more, um, in terms of commitments. Um, but you know, I, I think you know, faculty love to share their scholarship and talk to students about what they're researching and, and build those relationships. Um, I just would be careful about what you commit to doing and just realize that if a professor's like, you know, if if you if there's a research area you're interested in, and a professor's like, well, you know, maybe not this year, it's not personal. It's just they're probably thinking what I articulated, which is let me see, you know, let's let them at least learn the blue book and you know get some sea legs before I try and build this research relationship. Thank you. That's really helpful to hear. Uh, any other faculty want to weigh in on, on that question? I'm, I'm happy to weigh in. Um, so I would lean, and I, I think that that was a very diplomatic way uh, <laughs> of saying, saying what I, I probably won't be quite as diplomatic. I think that generally speaking, I would recommend really focusing on that first year and accomplishing yourself. Now, I think there's a serious value in um, getting relationships with your professors, and I think you can develop those that first year. Um, and so when you start seeing professor that you feel like you would work well with and you find their research interesting, I think that you can start developing those relationships. But in general, I would wait until your second or third year to want to do anything that would be um, a little more research related. And in fact, a lot of times, um, the for me personally, I generally will um, seek out people who are on the law review for my research assistants because they're accustomed to being able to do the type of research that I need done. Um, and they know blue booking and all the things that I need um, that I will specifically, because because like right now I'm writing an article that is um, for a, 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 an, a chapter that's for a book um, that is not a law book and I don't know what I'm doing. And, and in other words, it's the same thing for you. You won't really know quite what's going on yet with the legal type of research and the legal citations and all the things that are going to be needed until you're a little bit further along. So you, the research is great, but there, it's just different. And so I would just, my recommendation would be to wait until your second or third year um, to do that, but, but still start getting those relationships with the professors now in your first year. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to interject that I agree with both um, Professor Morales and Professor Warren. I think that there's an expectation actually at the Law Center that you wouldn't research, take on a research position um, your first year um, because law school is unique. And there's so many things about the law and about how we cite the law and the type of researching that we do that you learn in your first year, or at least you're exposed to in your first year, um, that as Professor Morales said, you're, you're more useful after you've been through that first year. I also wanted to, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the law review, Professor Warren mentioned the law review. The law review is essentially um, the honor society, if you will, of uh, law students. And um, most students who um, serve on the Law Review have been asked to do so based upon their first year grades. Now, there are other ways that you can get on the Law Review. Um, you can enter what is known as the write on competition where you write a paper. But in order to do that, you have to meet a certain threshold grade. GPA. 
uh, based on your first year grades. So your first year grades, you know, not to overstate it, but they're important. And um, like, you know, just like Professor Warren said, she selects her research assistants from the law review. Those are people who have excelled in law school based on their grades. So um, I, I think it's really important to focus on your, your first year grades mean a lot. Um, there's a steep learning curve as to how to do law school. Um, you're all smart enough to, you know, learn the materials, but there is a way that you have to, to you know, organize and, and provide your knowledge to us. And all that's learned in the first year. So um, keep that in mind as well. Thank you, Professor Duncan. Um, I just see another hand. We're going to go to uh, Lucy, your question. Yeah, um, thank you so much for hosting this. My name is Lucy Jayala, and I'm kind of piggybacking off of the grade situation. I just recently learned about the law school curve and that there is a curve in law school. So is there anything that we can be doing before August and we're actually um, in classes to set us up to be successful in that grading structure, just based on um, the importance of class rank in your first year? I'm happy to offer some advice on that. So all of your professors for your first year, first off, Lucy, that's a terrific question. Thank you for asking it. Um, all of your professors will have posted their syllabus and or course description online through the uh, Law Center's website. There's like a, a page devoted to that. And so I would immediately go and look at the syllabi for your classes. Um, sometimes, like for mine right now, for anyone who's in the part-time program, mine is a draft version, and I will finalize it in the next month or so. But basically, within a month of the classes starting, there should be a final syllabus. So the first thing I would say is, you know, piggybacking on what my colleagues have said about organizing, and especially Professor Duncan treating this as a full-time job, I would say to get ahead is, to, is the most important thing before you start. And there's a lot that you cannot do, okay, to prepare, but to the extent that you could read for at least the first week or so, right, um, before you begin, it, it depends on the type of class, and I'll explain that in a minute, um, that would be helpful. So I would definitely try and get my materials as quickly as possible and really focus on those syllabi. I have students each semester who reach out to me before class. My email is in my syllabus material. And so they ask me specific questions. And so we have conversations so that I can clarify things. So my class is a little different from the other classes that you'll take first year. The LSS classes are what we call skills classes. So they're not the kind of class where you're mastering a particular area of doctrinal law, like constitutional law or torts or something like that. Um, we are teaching you the mechanical skills that you'll use throughout practice and throughout law school, which is why you have us for two semesters. So preparing for my class and my colleagues, LSS colleagues class is a little bit different. You can actually read ahead in our classes. So our textbooks are on the how to. How is legal writing different from my undergraduate experience, whether I had a STEM uh, 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 you know, degree or whether I had a liberal arts degree? How is it different? How do we organize things? How do we research? And so I always advise my students a few weeks before class, start reading my textbook. Different for your doctrinal classes because part of the way you learn is to read a case and then to have a conversation about that with your professors in their class and I'll let them speak to that. So reading ahead, I will let them, I will defer to them on whether that's as efficacious, but for a skills class, I think it is actually helpful and then reach out with any questions that you have. Um, and I would also say before you begin, start the process of organizing your time. So I invite you to use whatever you know, app works for you, but have a master calendar where personal life and family life and school life are all marked in, not just deadlines for your due dates, but also when I have to do various things and understand it's gonna take you a lot longer to do that. And I guess finally, if you have a hard deadline, like in my class for a writing assignment that's on date X, I would, set up soft deadlines up until that date X to accomplish A, B, and C. This you, you will do as you get into the semester, not beforehand. Does that make sense? But I think those students who plan ahead with soft deadlines tend to do the best in skills classes. And I defer to my colleagues for their uh, doctrinal classes. 
Yeah, I mean, I think Lauren, uh, I mean, Professor Simpson, I'm sorry. I, I'm so, I still get used to the formality of Southern. I'm now at a Southern law school and we're always calling each other professor. Um, it's very funny. Um, in any case, um, Professor Simpson, um, I think is absolutely, you know, I would say for doctrinal classes, I, I don't think it makes much sense. At least I, I think she's right. I don't think it makes a ton of sense to read ahead. I mean, I, I think, I, I get frustrated by this every year. I mean, I think I, I'm not a big fan of the way we do things in terms of grading and curves. And um, I think a lot of it is extremely artificial. And I think a product of often kind of where people come into the law school with what sets of skills and not a reflection of their ultimate capacity. So, you know, I, I but my skepticism doesn't mean I don't have to follow the rules. They're, they're, they're beyond my pay grade. You know, I have to curve people. I have to grade people. So, um, but I guess what I would say is what I find is you should be ruthlessly honest with yourself about what your strengths and weaknesses are. You know, if you didn't get a degree in undergrad where you were writing 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 pages a semester, you're probably going to be a weak writer, you know, I mean, and you just have to be kind of honest about that. Um, because it's a very writing intensive field. Your exams are going to be writing intensive. Certainly LSS classes are. And so I think you, you really ought to assess like where you are in terms of writing skills um, and strengths. Um, I think too, you know, reading, reading comprehension, et cetera. You know, I mean, I think how much reading are you doing? Um, Cause again, um, that's a huge thing. So I guess I would suggest almost less law and more like, you know, start reading a real newspaper. Like if you're conservative, the Wall Street Journal, or if you're liberal, the New York Times or the Washington Post, like, Every day, look at how those people write. Because legal writing is different, but it's not that different than good writing in any field. So, you know, I, I would really up your reading content to the extent it's lower um, in, in anything, um, but anything that's good writing. So when I say good writing, I mean top tier journalism. I mean top tier nonfiction. I mean um, The New Yorker. Um, Texas Monthly, um, pay attention to how these people write and how they're expressing ideas. If, if, if that's, if in your self-assessment, you know that's something you're gonna need to work on in advance. I also, oh, Professor Warren, did you wanna say something? Okay. Um, so I kind of have a different take on it and you know, it gets back to Professor Morales' comment about you know, advice. <laughs> um, it's gonna be all over the place. Uh, I, have, I guess I have two, two main points. Um, law school, as I've already said, and I don't mean to say it so much to scare you, but it's hard. And so therefore my advice is to enjoy yourself before you start law school. Uh, my advice is to um, drink in all of the things that you enjoy about life so that and, and experience all of those, go to the movies, read a good book, whatever it is that you wanna do, do it now. So that you are ready when you get to law school to focus a thousand percent on law school. Um, you know, for torts and criminal law, my, you know, the, as Professor Simpson said, doctrinal courses, I don't think it's gonna do you very much good at all. Actually, I think it's a waste of time to read in advance. Um, maybe the first week, you know, the first week's materials, sure. But everything that every day of law school in my classes, it builds on what I've taught you the previous day. And so there's only so much, you, I mean, you don't know what my emphasis is going to be or my explanation about concepts um, until you get to my class. And so if you're trying to figure it out on your own and you're figuring it out in a way that I don't think is useful for you or for learning the law, then you're just wasting your time if you've read ahead for three or four weeks. So uh, my, my advice would be don't do that. I think in LSS, it sounds like you can totally do that. And, my, and the other doctrinal courses, I don't think that it makes too much sense until you figure out 
what is being asked of you and how you're being asked to learn the law. Um, that was my first point. I know that's a long point. My second point will be a little shorter because I think Lucy, you asked about uh, the curve, right? And the and and so here's here's the reality reality about how we have to grade. We are forced to um, consider all of our students and make them fit average. Their their grades taken together have to um, amount to a, a, a specific you know, bracket, a, a specific range of grades. And so what that means, practically speaking, for you as a student is this. Again, it's not like undergrad where if everybody turned in an A paper, they get an A. The reality is, is, is if I'm teaching torts and I have 70 students in my class, everybody can turn in an outstanding exam or they could do very well on all their assessments which would an undergraduate perhaps because you know we're getting the brightest of the bright in law school perhaps it would be all A's for everybody but in law school that is impossible impossible there will only be a couple of A's and then a and then a few more A minuses and mostly B's you know between B plus and B minus then a couple of C's so what otherwise would have might have been an A effort in undergrad in law school, it can't possibly be an A for everyone. I'm not permitted to do that as I'm grading your exams, uh, assigning grades. So my second big piece of advice thing that you should do before you get to law school, in my opinion, is convince yourself and accept the fact that your best effort is going to be good enough for you. All you can do is your very, very best. And you should be happy and accept your very, very best without regard to what grade is assigned to your best effort. Because again, I can't assign everybody an A. And so, you know, only 10% of the class are going to earn an A. The 90% just have to be satisfied with their best effort. And so I think that that's just a mindset that you have to embrace it will make law school a whole lot less stressful if you're not worried about the grade that you're going to earn, but instead you're worried about you doing your absolute best effort because that's where the reward is, I think. So I don't know if I said that as artfully as I wanted to, but I hope you get my point. I, I, I wanna add to it and I, I don't wanna belabor all this, but I think I have a little bit of a different perspective that I would like to share. So. I think there are three ways, three things that go into getting a top grade in, in law school. Um, one of them is knowing the substance of whatever the topic is. So that's pretty clear. The other one is um, organizing your writing in a way that is clear and concise. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then the third way, and I find this to be probably the most important thing, is understanding what your professor wants of you. Um, so I can tell you before I went to law school, I was a paralegal and I practiced in the area of torts. And I mean, I knew torts. I had been a paralegal for six years. I knew everything about torts. I knew how to file a complaint. I knew how to do all, everything there was to do with torts. I got into law school and I thought that I could just, again, go it on my own. Didn't need to talk to anybody. Didn't need to ask any advice. Didn't need to figure it. I could do it myself. Got into that torts exam. That was my lowest grade I've ever had in history, let alone like law school. And it's because I didn't organize my thoughts in a way that the teacher wanted, the professor wanted me to. Um, and so let me go back to, so substance, just start for, for doctrinal stuff, just start that on the first day. As Professor Duncan said, this is stuff that your professor is going to really guide you, help you and, and the substance for doctrinal, I wouldn't start anytime sooner than first day. Learning how to write, I will respectfully disagree with um, Professor Morales, and I'm really sorry about this. My best answers and my best writers are not those who do like journalism type writing. They are clear, they're concise, they write short sentences, and they use an IRAC format. They have the issue, they say the rule, they apply that rule, they conclude, and they move on. So sometimes I get 
Student I agree control. with that, Gina, for the record. I, oh. I demand the same thing. We're not. Okay, different. there you go. But I just I think you can it. learn about good writing from good journalism. That's all. I think you could. I think, though, that there's a difference in legal writing and um, um, what I would consider like fluff writing. I don't think fluff writing gets you anything in law school. Maybe there are some professors. And again, this is where that third point comes in. Go find out what your professor likes. Um, but uh, but being concise in your writing and using a format that the LSS is going to teach you um, is just super important. So using that format that they're going to teach you on your final exams, because your final exam is about the professor knowing that you know what you're doing and being able to find that answer easily. So, so that goes to the third point. Most important thing you can do, in my opinion, is to find out what that professor wants. Find out, do they want you to say case names in their final exam? Do they want you to make arguments in their final exam? Do they, how, what do they want? Find out, get a, get a copy of their previous um, final exam, get a copy if you can of the best answer. If, you, if they don't have that available, just go talk to them, say, what do you want? Like, what is your format? Um, and I would say 95% of your professors are going to tell you. Um, if they don't tell you, then find a mentor who will. Find somebody who's had them in that class and they know how they, they, they test, they know what they're looking for and go find them. Talk to their TAs, their teaching assistants. These are the people who probably got top grades in their class. Say, what did you do? How did you organize your answer? Um, and so go talk to them. And, and again, I just can't express enough that you're not the first one to take these professors usually. You're not the first one, like go find out. Go find out, find out what they want. But I believe what Professor Duncan said, go live it up this summer. And I mean, have fun, read, do amazing things, whatever it is, and then come in prepared to, to go to work for your first day. So. Ms. Anderson. I, I just wanted to say that what I call, what Professor Moore, uh, Warren was describing, I tell my students this all the time. If you're taking Professor Morales' class, you need to speak Morales ease back to him. If you're taking Warren's class, you speak Warren ease. Speak to your professors, which means writing, you know, your exam answers or what have you, in the way they spoke to you the entire semester. And, and that will help in, as part of, you know, it's just part of what uh, Professor Warren eloquently said before. I agree a thousand percent. Okay. Um, May I add one little thing, little clarification on? Okay. So when I say read ahead, I would say by chunk of topic, and I would say not beyond the first or second week for LSS. We usually teach a certain type of topic about hierarchy of authority and the rest. And I would kind of live in that world a little bit early so that you can see context, but everything builds, our skills build as we move through. So that was just the one clarification I wanted to make. Awesome. All right. We have several hands up. And so what I may do in the interest of time is just select a, a individual faculty member to answer the question as opposed to all faculty members asking, answering all questions, because I want to be able to get to all of the students. So Julia, your hand's been up. What's your question? Thank you so much again, everybody, for making some time today. <laughs> Professor Warren, um, you know, pretty much pretty much answered my question. Um, I did wanna know what kind of academic support is offered in first year classes, but it sounds like first year classes do have TAs and maybe old practice exams that students can reference. Um, but maybe for the doctrinal courses, um, how do professors feel about supplemental aids? Do you think they're necessary, maybe important to understanding case law? Um, Professor Duncan, I'll have you grab that one. I don't think that supplemental aids are necessary. I think that if, I think it's, you're gonna be reading a lot if you're just reading the assigned materials. Um, if you try to read the assigned materials and supplemental materials as well, uh, you know, that's almost impossible to do. And I think that if you are reading before you get to class and attending every class, following your professor, um, then that should be just fine. I don't really, unless your professor recommends a particular supplement 
I don't think that you need a particular any supplement. Uh, we do have TAs. It kind of just varies from professor to professor. Um, and as Professor Warren had mentioned, that the TAs that we select, though, are the students who did very, very well in our classes, usually, typically. Um, so yes, you should get to know your TAs, um, ask them what the secret sauce is for that particular course and that particular professor. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, to the other Decker. three, To the other three faculty, if you disagree with anything your colleague has indicated, please uh, share that information. Yep, we're all good. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, Mr. Gray, what's your question? I know you had your hand up, then you took it down and you put it up. But yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, because it kind of answered my question earlier, and then I had to think about something. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you all for this. Um, I'm Al Gray. Um, the question I had was, uh, what are some ways y'all keep students on track? Like, do you provide like early, like a lot of quizzes beforehand, or is it just like you kind of prepare yourself until final? Uh, Professor Morales, what do you say? You got quizzes going on? I mean, on? this is, mm -hmm. law school is not about handholding. You are grown-ups, and there's certainly movements within legal education to have more sort of um, assessments. I mean, I certainly, the way I do it in con law is I have two in-class ungraded exams, and then people can come to my office and I will go over their exam with them and tell them exactly where they went wrong in real time. I find that's very helpful and has a high demand from students. But no, you know, I mean, the way I look at it is you're grownups. Um, you are adults. You can, you know, come to class. You can, I mean, I know you're supposed to come to, but I mean, really the way I see it is it's your money. It's your time. We have top flight faculty here. Um, and it's really up to you to do the work now with the caveat that I will give you whatever help you need if you ask me. Also, I mean, you know, when I have one great thing about doing the in-class exams that I then go over is when I see one that's weak, I tell people, this is weak, you need to come back. And I, or I raise concerns. So it's not that we're totally not paying attention, but at the end of the day, it's, it really is, this, in my view, the student's responsibility um, to seek out the resources that they need with the caveat that I will be as open and honest and as helpful as I possibly can with, um, with dealing with those requests. But no, the handholding does not exist. I, I'll add one thing. I think that it just depends on the professor. Um, so some professors, you're going to have more opportunity to do things like my, I have three practice problems that I do that TA is great for me. And they tell me if a student is not, um, is not doing progressing the way we want. I also do Socratic method in, in class. So if a student's not prepared, I'll go talk to them after class and be like, are you okay? Is there anything wrong? Is there something that you need? If a student's absent very much. So I'll go contact, like I'm kind of a, I, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very interactive. I get, I go, I hunt my students down and see what's going on with them and make sure they're all right. Um, and so it just depends on the professor. Some professors, you wouldn't have any kind of anything. Like all you get is the final exam and, and you don't get anything else. And so, um, so those professors in particular, uh, you want to, I would, I would recommend trying to do, uh, get in with our TAs um, to make sure that you feel like you're um, progressing. But some of those professors, I think maybe even don't have TAs. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. So, but you'll have a mix, you'll have a mix of that. Okay, thank you. And for, and for those professors who don't have TAs, um, hunt down the students who did well, just hunt them down, just flat out hunt them down. You know, like who, who was in the class and then don't take advice from somebody who earned a, a, I hate to say it, and it sounds very snobby. Don't take advice from somebody who didn't do well. Um, you know, somebody earned a B minus or something, go find the person who got the A and ask them. Okay, okay. Um, I know that Deborah was next with a question. I think Deborah got booted out, but I let her back in. So Deborah, if you have a question still, you may come off uh, mute and, uh, ask your question. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, sorry about that. My, okay. 
connected um thank you all for being here i would put my camera on but i am in the gym so i don't want to um put that on right now but i do have a question i don't know if it got answered or asked while while i'm absent but if you are interested in being a research assistant and i understand like the first year you're not um from what i understand I could be wrong but i heard you know you're not supposed to work you're just supposed to be in school so at what stage would you say you can start speaking with professors to um, kind of figure out, how, you know, when to apply for those type of positions? Anybody want to take that? All right, Professor Simpson, uh, you want to take that one? I'll call you out. <laughs> well, we are probably, because we're clinical faculty, we tend not to have research assistants on a regular basis. So I'm the only one here who probably can't answer. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll we'll just repeat what we said last time, second and third year. Second not, and third year. Not the first year. I think that was pretty much the consensus. I think yeah. so. And I, I think and they I, also said that you can cultivate the relationship prior, but you should not be doing any research. That's yeah, I get the answer. majority. I get the majority of my research assistants from my classes. So there are students who have been in my class who get to know me. Uh, they stop by office hours and visit with me, and then eventually, when the semester is over, they'll say, "Hey, do you hire research assistants? Can I apply?" And so that's basically how I find my research assistants. I'm not sure about Professors Warren and Morales. Awesome, uh, Sophia. Your hand's been up a while. Uh, your turn. Ask your question. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Uh, my question is quick. I'm just wondering what what you think is a very common mistake one else make that you wish you could tell them to avoid. <laughs> good question, Sophia. Good question. Who wants to start with that one? I, I think I'd like to hear from all the faculty if that's okay uh, for that particular question. I think it's what Professor Warren has been saying over and over and over, actually, not getting help. Right. Or, or not, or being afraid. Like, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I offered to review all my students' exams with them in person. Not everybody takes me up on that. I would say about half, maybe three quarters do. I offer, if I see a bad exam, I say, why don't you redo this and come back? Most people don't follow up. And so that's, you know, that is the thing you have to do. And that's where I say, I mean, and Professor Warren, I mean, I think it's wonderful that she does what she does for students tracking them down, but my view is a little different. And I think it's frankly among the more common view, which is, I mean, I'm gonna give you all the tools and I will do anything you ask me to do within reason, but I am not gonna take responsibility for your education. And, you know, whether that's fair or not, I don't know, but I mean, I've, I've arrived at this after 11 or 12 years of doing it. So the only person who's gonna take responsibility for your education, in my view, truly, apart from all the wonderful stuff that Professor Warren and I'm sure my other colleagues do, and I'm just too mean to do, is um, you. So, um, you know, it's your time, it's your money, it's your career. Um, and I think the sooner you understand that, that like, you know, and I think the message from everybody here has been playtime is over. And I think that's right. You're taking on a huge, this is probably the most important decision you've made in your life to come to law school. You should take it seriously. If I could just add, I would say, where was Professor Warren when I went to law school? Okay, because my law school was full of Professor Morales. And that's okay, but I got it. I made it through. I, I needed you, Professor Warren. <laughs> I think it takes a village, right? I think, and I think that the benefit of the law center is that when you have, you'll be exposed to all different kinds of professors who have all kinds of expectations. And, and um, I just tend, I, like, like Professor Morales said, I mean, just after teaching for so long, this is how it works for me. Um, and so you have professors that figure out how it works for them. And that's just kind of, it'll be different as, it, as it's different for you. Um, my recommendation for you for first year is, is to not fall behind. Um, that's my biggest recommendation. I completely actually agree with everything Professor Mara said, um, but don't, don't fall behind. And the reason is, is because the way that law school is taught 
especially your first year doctrinal classes, and also LSS, I would imagine, right, is that they're building blocks. And so if you fall behind, it's you miss, if you, and you don't have that foundation, it's gonna be really tough to catch up. And so keep those outlines, keep up on the reading, keep the outlines going, make sure you're staying on top of it. I used to do it every weekend. So that's what I would do on Friday and Saturday. I would make sure my outlines were up to date. Um, Thursday, I would go out and have fun. Um, Thursday night, I would have fun. Friday, I would, Friday afternoon after I woke up, I would do my, um, my outlines and, um, and do those and make sure I was ready for the next week. And it, falling behind is really, um, really something that I've found that my students who get behind, it's really tough to get, catch back up. Um, and you just miss stuff. And so keeping on top of it would be my biggest recommendation in addition to what was already said. And I agree with all of that. My, um, what I think that students fall victim to um, is, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way because you do have to do, you, you do have to do the work on your own. But, but I think that if you try to do all of law school all by yourself on your own, you are shortchanging your education. It is really important to talk to your classmates to have, I call them study groups. They're not really, it's a, it's a misnomer because it's not being in a group and studying together, but a group from your first year section of, you know, no less than two people, no more than like five, any more than that, you're talking about what bar you're going to and everything, you know, who's doing what. Um, you need a small group of people that you can hash things through, talk about the course materials with from the first week of law school all the way through the three years. And so I think that's the biggest mistake. A lot of, but I'm a, I'm a tremendous introvert. I am an uber introvert. I'd like to do things on my own, but studying law is not one of those things or learning the law is not one of those things that you really can do most effectively by yourself in your own little bubble. You've got to have exposure to other people. So 100% with my colleagues, you know, and the, and the only thing that I would add is if you feel like you're in, in trouble a little bit, you know, like you're starting to get behind or you're feeling overwhelmed, then reach out to somebody. And, and I would say reach out early. Um, your professor, if you're not comfortable with your professor, student services have wonderful, compassionate, extremely skilled individuals and you will not be the first one who's had you know uh, facing a challenge and so reach out early um, if you need help on anything but I absolutely concur with everything else that they've said. I would agree reach out early and often right so just because you reached out once don't feel like oh I must be bothering them I can't not at all uh, nobody's gonna uh, make you feel that way. Um, I am mindful of the time and the fact that our faculty members have generously donated their time. We are at 1256. I have time for one more question if there is one. If there isn't, um, I would like to thank everybody for attending. I would uh, Angela, can you just make a pitch for um, office hours? I know that's happened in the okay. comments, yeah. but um, sure. you know, I mean, students are always like, you know, can I come to office hours? I was like, office hours is literally your time. Like we, we, we literally have to do it. <laughs> I mean, I like office hours. I want to do it. I want to talk to you, but it's literally your time. So yes, yes, you can come. Um, and you ought to. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and really, I think, and, and I will say this is a first gen thing too, and, and, a, and a function of your undergrad. I, I tend to see the people in office hours who are a bit more sophisticated in terms of their background. And I feel like the, the in terms of, or privileged or what, however we want to say it. And, you know, and that's fine. I like those people. But I'd love to, you know, and, and I encourage everybody to come and I try and, you know, make a first gen pitch like I'm doing to you. But there is, a, I think a lot of first gen students don't really see the value unless they have like a super specific, but really just coming to introduce yourself for five or 10 minutes. And I mean, 
I, I got a student a job who came to introduce herself. You know what I mean? Like things like that happen, you know, like literally this semester as a first year, a student came to me to ask for career advice. I gave it to her and I put her in touch with a partner at Skadden, which if you don't, so we have things to offer you. And if you ask, we will give it to you. And we like doing that for you, but you have to show up. Yeah, here, here. I mean, we are required to keep office hours. I can't tell you how many times I sit in my office by myself, <laughs> which is great. I can get a lot done, but you all are supposed to be coming by and talking to us and not just to learn the materials or to, you know, exercise your brains on what we have been feeding you for the last week or whatever semester, but also because you, you eventually you're going to need a recommendation letter. Eventually you're going to need something from us and we can't do you justice if we don't know you well. So please do come by. Don't be afraid of your professors if you're super shy or whatever, or you're like, I just can't even stand it. Then what you should do is, is bring up a, a buddy with you. Both of you come by and talk. Absolutely. All right. Great advice. All right. So now it's one o'clock. Professor Warren had to go. Um, and she, uh, I definitely appreciate her joining us along with her colleagues. And so just a little bit of pitch for um, our future webinars, check the Amida students web page. We try to do these every other Wednesday or so on various topics. Uh, if you missed any of our uh, sessions, the recording, the links to the recordings are there. And again, thanks everybody for joining. Appreciate it. <laughs>